Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Will McGarvey. This is Reverend Christy Ramage from East County Shared Ministry. We're here for our weekly devotion, and I have a prayer by Dr. Elizabeth A. Johnson, who's a Christian feminist and professor of theology at Fordham University in New York City. And um, she uses this term Sophia Wisdom, which is also the name given by Paul to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 1, where, he re where she, uh, Paul refers to Jesus as the Sophia of God, the Wisdom of God. Great Spirit, Creator, Mother of the world, like a person you seem to be always drawing near and passing by, to empower your creatures toward life and well-being, in the teeth of the antagonistic structures in our political reality. Welcome, Spirit of Hope. Welcome, Sophia Wisdom. Welcome, Empowering Strength. She who is and will always be free, loving, and infinitely creative. Hmm. Would you mind rereading the first, I think it was the two, maybe first four lines of that, that the sense of walking with us, close to us, that language was just really beautiful. And I know you yeah. just put the book down and you lost the page. So. <laughs> it's okay, I can find it again. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, great spirit, creator, mother of the world, like a wind you seem to be always drawing near and passing by yeah. to empower your creatures toward life and well-being in the teeth of the antagonistic structures of our political reality. Yeah, I, just, I love that, just the, the closeness of that and the interweaving of it and the, the presence of that. that that's, it's really beautiful. And well, Lady we, Wisdom is, uh, in, in the scriptures we read Sunday in Proverbs 4 and 8, she's the one who is a, an expression of God who's present at the creation, and she's at the crossroads asking people if they will learn justice from her. Yeah, yeah. And, and that metaphor of cross, crossroads where we in our lives come to points of decision and can either choose one direction or another direction and that it's in those places of choice often that we experience wisdom. And, and the struggle sometimes to discern wisdom also I think is really the challenge. And then to have this sense that Christ is God's wisdom. So that in those places of choice, I think the Christ and how that's manifest through Jesus, the person becomes informative for our own decisions, our own choices. And she's the feminine face of God, even in the New Testament, Sophia wisdom is, um, is uh, discussed in the gospels. There are points where Jesus and John are de described as the children of wisdom or vindicated by wisdom in their deeds because they're doing the deeds that they've learned from wisdom. Yeah, and the feminine face of God is something that we in Protestant circles don't really have much experience with. And I think it's, it's important to, to allow wisdom to, to reveal herself to us uh, and to use her as an, a, way, a new not new in terms of the, the history of Christianity, but I think often new for some people in our circles I mean, to really speak of wisdom and this, this feminine quality of God that is incarnate, that is alive in the earth as, as God's creative power in many ways. And that one of the things I had thought about is that, is that if we see wisdom as this presence in our own choice making, in our own decision making, and in our encounters with other pieces of creation, that there's a, a quality of wonder, I think, that often is tied to wisdom. Also, those, those aha moments or those heart expanding moments where we recognize the presence of Christ and can feel that pull in one decision or another, or feel it in our encounters with the natural world, that there's something, somehow those two in my experience are interwoven that the wisdom and the wonder mm -hmm. so how does that play out every day for you well i think that it, it it was actually part of what happened on sunday which was the ex exploration of wisdom and inviting people at least from the worship team to to talk about their 
you know, their individual lives and their experience of wisdom. And that, that my experience within that was of, you know, spending often a part of every day walking along the river and, and feeling in that encounter with the water that there often is this sense of, of relationship and this sense of opening to, to another part of myself that feels more attuned to wisdom, um, feels less ego centered, less ego defined and that actually is kind of this expansive space that is a Christ-filled space, I think, to use that other language. Um, and that it, it often comes for me in these encounters with the natural world. Well, and the thing with rivers and water, as the, the Buddhists like to say, um, that there's no such thing as, you'll never come to the same river twice, right? Exactly. The, the water that's coming through in its own cycle from the Sierras and down through the Sacramento River and the joining with the San Joaquin River um, is always a, a new experience every day. Yes, and then, and I've, I've mentioned this before when we've had these conversations, but that, that Jesus uses those examples, those images of water also, as a way to speak about our experience of him in some ways. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting, but that, that, that sense that he uses the, the, the reality of our faith life being experienced as if there is grace flowing from us as an ever flowing stream. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful, I think water has a very. A and very abundance. Possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Especially um, from that region of the world that today is much more arid than it was in the days of Jesus, but. He has so many agricultural metaphors in his teaching that you can tell that he was born in the Galilee, which is kind of the breadbasket of northern Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet even then, I mean, there is desert land in Israel. So I think that his appreciation of water probably is also a part of that, that, that it's not lush, it's not a lush green land. I mean, it is a, a place that's really dependent upon water for its life. Um, as is as is California, I think. I, mean, I think we we have similar environmental and weather conditions in these two in these two places. Yeah. So, and what's so, the role of wonder? So, I think that wonder is really it's about that that moving into that place of awe, that place of of. I mean, almost childlike delight, just, just the, that sense that we are part of this incredible mystery that is creation. And that I think that that, that capacity to wonder, to be open, and to realize that, that, that in that opening, we don't control what we are in awe of, but we are responsive to something that is alive around and through us. And going back again to those first phrases of the, the prayer that you read at the beginning, I mean, we, I think wonder opens us to the capacity to experience that aliveness, that spirit, that wisdom that moves, that moves through us. Um, so I think wonder is about opening and wisdom may be about what comes to us when we're open. Hmm. Yeah, I've always been um, surprised um, at this interplay around wisdom and justice. Yes. Especially in the Proverbs texts. That comes through a little bit in some of the intertestamental texts. And I think we as Protestants aren't as familiar with them because Calvin and Luther left those books out of their versions of the Bible. Um, uh, they didn't keep the intertestamental deuterocanonical books like Tobit and Wisdom of Solomon and Judith um, and the others. Uh, but, and there's a lot more wisdom literature in the, that section. Um, but when we come to Proverbs 3 and 4 and 8 and 10 and some of these other places and even the way that the gospel writers weave, uh, especially Matthew and Luke, 
weave uh, the story of John the Baptizer and Jesus with this figure. Um, in uh, in some places, they're, they're the children of wisdom, and in some places they're vindicated by wisdom's deeds, which, which is almost like the book of James. If you've got faith, show it to me. Yeah. Pro prove it to me. But there's also this element of... Um, Jesus and, uh, well, especially Jesus, John the Baptizer to a lesser degree, are viewed as wisdom incarnate. And in the first verses of the prologue of the Gospel of John, um, instead of the term wisdom, the term logos, which is the favorite theological term of um, the, uh, the Jewish scholar in Alexandria who did so much, uh, Philo of Alexandria talked a lot about God as logos, as word, especially um, looking at that the way that the words were used to create and to separate the days and and even separate the the skies and the land and the waters from the waters above and the waters below and all of those aspects. Uh, he really focuses a lot on that word, this logos, this divine principle. Um, but a lot of the way that the writer of the Gospel of John, who we don't know who it was, we don't have an autographed copy, um, talks about Logos is so similar to the way Proverbs and the intertestamental writers talk about wisdom that you can tell that, that they're viewing Jesus as like Lady Wisdom present at the, at the beginning of the creation, glorying in God's creation, and it's that wonder, it's that um, celebratory aspect of abundance at the creation that mm -hmm. seems to be so much a part of the wonder piece of the creation narratives. Yes, and, and, that, and then the wonder, as you've made the, the connection, that wonder, I think, deepens us within our own human lived experience so that we can then know the Christ, which is compassion, which is love, which is justice, that we move to that, that, that kind of heart-centered way of being alive in a human body that Jesus shows us that really is grounded in justice, really is Even... grounded in welcoming those who are on the margins. And that's the interconnectedness, I think, of the, the Hebrew worldview that I think we miss as Westerners. When we are reading these scriptures, we are reading them often with our own cosmology of being separate as individuals, of, of using other people and other parts of creation as resources in a very utilitarian way, rather than reading it in uh, the context of relationship which was the basis of the cosmology of the ancient Hebrews. Yes, and when you move into relationship from this place of wonder and appreciation, you, you move towards justice. I right mean, relationship. Are, I'm sorry? Justice as right relationship. Exactly, and that you honor the, the thou in the, the, the other beings and, and living entities around you and then are committed to their well-being, which I think is the root of justice, that, that there's this, this sense that in relationship, you can't just care for yourself. I mean, in relationship, the, 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 the definition of relationship is that there's a mutuality and a reciprocity and that, that possibility for for encounter and healing and then working for each other's well-being. Which again is what Jesus was the embodiment of, I believe, that, that healing quality of being in relationship. And teaching people how they can live like it's heaven on earth even under Roman occupation. Exactly, yeah. And even facing into death and being able to forgive from that place of absolute end and then move to resurrection. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's extraordinary that these kind of the deep currents of our faith and, and what the person in life of Jesus, who is the Christ, shows us and calls us to live. 
Yeah, and yet we Americans need to reclaim a cosmology of the interconnectedness of all things in order to really get that piece of it. If we stay in our Western culture and use the lenses of our Western culture of, of using people and, and the natural world as resources, then we're not in that right relationship. Exactly, and maybe the pandemic is going to help with that refocus. And potentially we're going to learn something during this time about relationships, not only with other humans, but with the land. I mean, the fact that, that we've stopped so much of our activity and that the air is becoming cleaner, that animals are starting to you know, walk onto freeways, you know, that, that there's just this sense that, that the earth has been given a break and that, and that we have the opportunity to discover new relationships with these, with these other living qualities and entities that we share the earth with. Yeah, I wish it was a bigger break. It was uh, we've only decreased our carbon output about 17% and mostly in the transportation sectors because we're still home using all of our electricity and everything, but there's still a lot more we could be doing to make the transition during this time. Yeah. And maybe we will. I mean, we'll see how this all unfolds, but at least it seems to me that there's the opportunity to understand ourselves in relationship to the earth and to each other in a different way because of and even pandemic. even to wild animals and our proximity to them and how that has played a key role in the um, sharing of viruses from one species to another oh interesting yeah yeah wisdom and wonder what wisdom and wonder yeah thanks so much and we'll uh Thank you. We'll see you Sunday and uh, continue to encourage folks that, uh, especially as we're thinking of the messages of wisdom that we've received in our lives, this next week we're going to be considering a time in our own lives where our eyes were open to see the world through the eyes of Christ. And so we invite you to think of any of those times in your life as we prepare for Sunday's service. And then two weeks from, uh, or two Sundays from now, will be Pentecost Sunday. So make sure you have your red washed and clean. <laughs> Two weeks to prepare, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're prepared already. There we go, yeah. I'll have my red coffee mug. It'll work. All righty, have a great week, everyone. See you. See you Sunday. Bye-bye. Right.